Welcome to the Clare Creek Water Recycling Plant. My name is Dave Grom and I'm the Director of Wastewater for the City of Pacifica. Today I'm going to take you along a tour of the Clare Creek Water Recycling Plant. Up on this diagram here, I have two plants. I have the old treatment plant down here. This is an activated sludge slope flow through plant. Up here is the new plant. And this is an advanced treatment facility. What that means is it removes over 99% of all solids and it removes ammonia nitrogen, which is critical. That's what makes it really advanced. Most treatment plants don't remove ammonia nitrogen. Ammonia nitrogen is uh, harmful to aquatic life. So it's very important for us to remove it because we discharge into a small creek and then it runs into the Pacific Ocean. So the flow diagram goes this way. Water comes in from pump stations throughout the city that's pumped here. It goes through grip removal first. Grip removal is where we're moving the inorganic material. The inorganic material is like rocks, sand, gravel. This stuff can't be eaten or burned. It has no value. So we remove it because it can only damage equipment down the line. So when we remove it, it comes off with some organic material with it. So then we wash the grit to get rid of the organic material, and then the grit falls out into a hopper where it's taken down to Ox Mountain landfill for disposal. It has no value. Then it goes on to our biological system, which is sequencing batch reactors. We have five of these tanks. These tanks um, do all the biological treatment. They do everything. Um, that is that this plant does in these three tanks it does in one of these tanks and it does it with very few moving parts in each tank there's two pumps there's a wasting pump and there's a mixing pump those are the only two moving parts in the tank and both of those are submersible so they can be removed while the tanks in service and a new one could be inserted SBRs they go through a cycle and this is an example of one cycle. One cycle takes about six hours. Each tank goes through about two cycles a day. In each cycle, a tank will be waiting in idle. And when it's in the idle position, it has about 15 feet of water in it, and it's waiting to be fed, and the, it's all computerized. The computerized, the computer will control this, and it will feed this tank when its turn comes up. When its turn comes up, it opens up the influent valve, starts filling the tank. It'll fill the tank. Remember I told you it was 15 feet of water in that tank. In that 15 feet of water, there's 10 feet of organisms and 5 feet of clear water on top. The organisms are going to do the work. So when it starts to fill, it fills 5 feet. So now it fills it up to 20 feet. So at 20 feet, the computer senses that, shuts off the influent valve, and starts filling another SBR. Going back to that SBR we just filled. When it's full, then it goes into react. What that means is a mixing pump comes on and a blower comes on. The mixing pump is to move the organisms and material around the tank so they, they can come in contact with each other. The blower provides air in the water. It pumps air into the water, which results in dissolved oxygen. All healthy water has dissolved oxygen. So the dissolved oxygen in there is for the organisms so they can breathe while they're, while they're metabolizing this food that we just put in there. So it goes through a react for about 160 minutes in our case. After 160 minutes, the organisms have literally eaten everything that's organic in that tank. And then the computer will sense that, it'll shut off the blower, shuts off the mixing pump, and then it goes into settle. settle. Because this is a bat system, there's no water flowing through that tank because the valve shut off and it started to fill another one. It becomes a perfect settling environment. And what that means is it's really quiescent. So the organisms, their bodies, they've already eaten, they're fat and happy, now they're going to sink to the bottom, leaving a clear water on top. Then it goes into a decant where it can remove the clear water on top. So a decanter which floats on the top of the surface, um, it opens up a valve and starts sucking in water on this float and the float goes down as the water level goes down. It goes down to 15 feet and then the thing shuts off. The computer senses that and shuts off the valve and then goes on to another tank. 
the clear water will go across the yard on this green line here and go to our sand filters. Sand filters have been around for a long time. They're a great technology. There's nothing really cutting edge there. It's just big beds of sand where the water is dumped on the sand and the water filters through it. Any particles that might be left in that water are going to get trapped in that sand. And then the common question is, well, what happens when the sand gets permeated with all that, that uh, dirt? Well, what happens is the computer senses that, and in the middle of the night, um, when we're not here, it backwashes a filter. So it picks one filter, and it runs our clean effluent back through the filter the other way, knocking all the particles out loose from the sand and putting it into a tank where it can be pumped up to the start of the plant for retreatment. After the sand filters, the water comes out very clear. Visually, you don't see any solids in it. From there, it goes through ultraviolet light disinfection. Ultraviolet light disinfection um, di disinfects the water, but it doesn't have any um, chemical byproducts, so there's no chemicals being used. We don't add chemicals to the water stream at this treatment plant. So most treatment plants use chlorine, which is a harsh chemical, and then they have to use a very harsh chemical to get rid of the chlorine before they can put it out in the environment. The result of those two harsh chemicals, there are a lot of chemical byproducts that are being discharged to the environment. So in this case, there are no harmful chemicals. Then it's discharged to the Clear Creek wetlands, which we'll take a look at today and talk a little bit about. And then from there it goes off to the um, Pacific Ocean. Going back to the SBRs, SBRs is where we grow the organisms to literally eat the waste that we give it. And these organisms, each, each one of these cycles, they're going to grow. Their masses are going to grow tremendously. And we literally have to get rid of about 15,000 pounds of these organisms each day from all the SBRs. So we call that wasting. So we run tests each day on every SBR, and we find out how many organisms we have in each SBR, and then we run it through a calculation, and we set up our wasting pumps to get rid of a, a certain volume in each SBR to maintain a population of organisms at a steady state, something that will work. If you get too many organisms in the tank, the tank won't work. If you get too little, the tank won't work. So it's really important, this population control. What do we do with those organisms after we um, get rid of them? So we pump them off the SBRs and it goes to biological um, biosolids holding tanks. Biosolids holding tanks have the ability to mix and aerate. This uh, keeps the organism alive. Trying to deal with this material with dead organisms is, is really difficult. So that's what we, we keep them alive. And it's very watery at this point. When we waste off of here, it's only coming in about about 3%, 4% solid at the most. Um, so it's mo mostly water. So water, we don't want to, we don't want to dispose of water. That's, that's not very cost effective. So then we thicken it up a little bit. So we send it to gravity belt thickeners, which we'll see today in our tour, and they thicken this material up a little bit. So like I said, it's about 3% solid. After it goes through the gravity belt thickener, it'll bring it up to about 6% solid. At 6% solid, it looks like very wet mud. Then it goes to our digesters. The digesters, um, don't like it too thin or they don't like it too thick. So about five to six percent solid is what they like. So that's what we give them. These digesters, we're the only ones in California that have this type of a digester. And the name is autothermal, thermophilic aerobic digestion. We call them ATADs for short. So from this point forward, we're going to refer to them as ATADs. ATADs, the advantage of ATADs is they do their work in about nine days. This type of digester, anaerobic digester, which is probably the most popular digester system in the United States, does its works in about 30 days. These digesters create class A sludge, which is unrestrictable use. You can use it on any crop. These digesters create class B sludge, which is not reusable. So class B sludge would have to go out to the farmlands out in our valley and go to a composting facility to be composted. When you do that, you lose control of your sludge and you don't get the, the benefit of it. So, 
also this digest, I said it does this work in nine days, it also sterilizes itself. It create, that's how it creates class A sludge. So all the disease that might be in the city, everybody that might be sick, all that disease is gonna to come to the treatment plant. So we have to disinfect it. So we disinfect the water with our ultraviolet disinfection system, and we disinfect the sludge with our ATAD digester system. And how does that happen? That happens, the organisms that live in this environment, they're, their byproduct when they metabolize food. So they're literally eating these organisms. They're reducing the volume of these organisms by about 50 or 60 percent. They're also, their byproduct is heat. So they create heat. Right now we have digestives that are running about 145 degrees. In 145 degrees, disease-causing organisms that cause disease in humans can't survive. So that's how it becomes sterile. So. This material can be handled safely, can be put on any type of a crop. It grows plants unbelievably. And uh, we've, done a, we've done a demonstration. One year we decided to try to grow a giant pumpkin. And we grew one, not knowing what we were doing. But we did it in sludge. And we uh, got a pumpkin at about 550 pounds, our first crack at it, which is not too shabby. So. Um, that's kind of it really quick. Now we're going to take a walk around the plant. We'll show you all these little different processes. Okay, where we're standing right now, I'm standing on top of a circular tank. This is where the grip is, is removed. As I showed you on the flow diagram, the first thing we removed is grip. So this is where it's happening. Over here, I'd like to bring our attention to the solar array. We have a fixed system right here. And then out there is a tracker system that actually tracks the sun as it moves through the sky. The difference between the two systems are this system, it peaks when, it's, when it starts producing power in the morning, like 9 in the morning, you'll see it start to come up. At noontime, it'll peak. And it's a 100 kW system, so it'll peak somewhere around there, and then it'll go down immediately to about 4 o'clock. That one out there peaks at nine in the morning, stays up to its, its maximum peak, and it'll run to about four o'clock and then drop down. So it produces a lot more power. Okay, now we're at a biological air filter. Obviously treatment plants create odors. So the material we're dealing with is very odorsy, and so um, we gotta deal with it. So, um, one thing we utilize here for odors is a biological air filter. And this is a natural air filter. There's a box, we created this box that holds a media, and the media is just wood chips. And the wood chips we get from local tree trimmers, and they bring them over here, and we accept them for free. So we get all the wood chips for free, and uh, we put them in this box. We keep the wood chips moist, and organisms grow on the wood chips, so they're using the wood chips as a media. As the air passes through the wood chips, the organisms will eat the impurities in the air. The wood chips last about four or five years, and at the end of four or five years, you get a really rich, great soil which uh, we remove to put new wood chips on, and then we take that material down to Half Moon Bay, and there's farmers down there that just love to take it, and they take it for free. Okay, we'll move on to the next section. We are the Gravity Belt Thickener. Gravity Belt Thickener, when I was talking downstairs in that flow diagram, when we were doing that population control, and the SPR is getting rid of some of those organisms, this is where they come to get rid of some of those water. So it's come in here about 3% solid, but mostly water. So what we do is we add a chemical called polymer and allows the organisms to clump together. You can see them clumping together. And it runs onto this belt, which is moving. The belt is porous. The water falls through the belt. And as you come down the belt, you can see the material gets drier and drier. The water's falling out through the belt, coming out the pipes alone. And that's going up to the start of the plant to retreat it. Back on the belt, it gets drier and drier, it goes down to the end here. There it falls into a hopper where then it gets pumped through the digester. Okay, here we're at the centrifuge. Centrifuges are at the end. After the digesters, they um, 
take the material, which from now to digest you, is probably still about four or five percent solid. There's a lot of water. We don't want to truck that away. It's going to cost us a lot of money. So we run into our centrifuge. The centrifuge is spin about 4,000 RPM. They literally spin the water off the solid. The solid falls out to the truck down below, which we'll take a look at in a little bit here. Um, and then the water that's taken off goes back to the start of the treatment plant for retreat. Okay, where we're at right now with the centrifuge discharge their solids. And they discharge it into this truck trailer right here. Where there it gets removed about two times a week and it's been taken to um, farmlands in Solano County, Sacramento County, and Merced County where it's land spread and uh, crops are grown for um, um, farm animals. Here's an example of some of the sludge right here. So you can see it's a very clean material, very rich, um, very high in nitrogen, great plant food. If you could smell this, this literally has no offensive odors to it. So it's a great product. Hopefully one day we hope to use it throughout the city. So now we're at the sand filters. As I explained before, science has been around a long time. This is a big bed of sand. As you can see, these troughs are overflowing into the lower section there, the lower section where the sand is. There's about 15 feet of sand in there. It filters through it and it comes out to the bottom, it comes out real clear liquid. seconds after pg e power drops off and um, all the computers that control the plant they also have uninterruptible um, power supplies so they have battery backup systems so even the computers don't shut down 
So in 15 seconds, the rest of the plant powers up and they usually um, don't miss a beat. What we have right now is the SCADA computer. The SCADA computer is the controlling computer. It gives us the um, ability to interact with the plant. So this is where we can see exactly what the plant is doing, and it also gives us the ability to make changes in the forms of set point changes. So on this screen here, we have the entire plant. Over here is the SBRs. As I stated when I was talking about SBRs, one SBR is always filling at a time. You can see that this one is filling, static fill. This is number five SBR. Anything that's red is either open or on. Things that are in green are either closed or off. So in this case, I can see the influent valve is open, which is filling, and um, there is a blower on providing air to this tank. So. Uh, this is very interactive. I can click on this blower here. I can get this screen here, which tells me how many cubic feet per minute the, the blower is putting out, how many amps the motor is going through, um, how open the valve is, the PSI pressure, um, bearing temperature, motor winding temperatures, a, a lot of different, a lot of important different information that we need to uh, analyze how things are operating. Also on this screen, you can ha we have trend screens, which we can put different information on a 24-hour strip chart. And on this particular one, it shows all the different SBRs. So each SBR is in a different color. And then it shows all the steps that that SBR just went through. As uh, when I showed you that diagram, I talked about all the steps an SBR goes through, react, settle, fill, decant. And this is showing me, in terms of time, when those things actually happened. And it's a great, a great uh, tool to analyze. You know, if we're not here, something goes wrong, we can open up these screens, and we can literally put anything in the plan on these screens and see what exactly happened so we can figure out what happened and how to uh, make sure it doesn't happen again. There's, uh, there's all various screens on these things, and there's a fuel tank here, um, over control, um, our effluent well. These are different set points that we change to control the plant. And you can also follow the flow diagram along and um, And you can, you can basically see different things. But um, this thing is very interactive. Um, That was the ultraviolet light disinfection system. There's the sand filters right here. Um, the SBRs. And um, the digesters. So as I was saying before, the digesters, they're, they're heated by biology. So here's digester one, it's 134 degrees. That's all done by biology. We don't have any external heat source here. We don't heat it up with natural gas. We don't use electrical power to heat it up. It's done with biology. So you have number two digest, 128 degrees. Number three is 124. And the last digest is 94, and that's done by design. Because we have to cool this material down, and we grow a different organism in this digester that removes ammonia. And that those organisms can't live in this kind of temperature range. So we cool it down before it goes in here, and then we grow these organisms that can remove ammonia. Okay. And one other really important point to make about the SCADA system here. This SCADA system here is obviously here at the plant, but every operator can get this on their PC at home. They can also get this on their smartphones. 
So wherever I am, I can get the plan on my smartphone or I can get the plan on my PC. So I'm at home, their plan's having a problem, they call me up and let me know, I can start my computer up, I can see what's going on. It's just a really great tool. Now we're in the plant lab. This is where we do a lot of tests um, to check ourselves. So we have, we um, are under a self-monitoring program with the state water board. So we have samplers that sample our effluent, our treated water, um, every day, seven days a week, 24-hour sampling. So we get a good snapshot of our water throughout the entire 24 hours. We bring it in the lab every morning and we run a whole host of tests. A, we do most of the tests ourselves, but there's a few tests that take very expensive equipment. We send those out from an outside lab to do those. But um, in this one here, we can do BODs and suspended solids, um, coliform. Um, we also do a test called the uh, bioassay test, where we have these very elaborate fish tanks. We bring in baby trout once a month and we run this five-day test where we have fish tanks that our water is running through the fish tank over a five-day period. So it's basically checking our effluent, a snapshot of 24 hours a day for five days. And we're checking the survival rate of these fish. We also, in this fish test, there is a control set of tanks where it's fresh water and we have a very elaborate filter system where we remove all the chlorine so the fish won't be killed by that. So we're checking the survival of the fish in the control tank opposed to our effluent tanks. And I can tell you this, we pass this test every month. And we pass this test with 100% survival. Okay, now we're in the fish bioassay room. This is the uh, very elaborate fish tank setup. And what it does is a water bath here. And all the fish tanks are in the water bath. And this has very um, sensitive equipment that keeps the temperature at precise temperature. And so all these tanks will have the same temperature. So the control tanks to the effluent tanks, there won't be any variance in the temperature. So the test um, would be valid. Right now we're not running this test. It looks like we're getting ready to start running it. That's why this particular tank is running. So we're getting this tank up to speed in terms of the temperature and the oxygen level so we can bring in the fish for the test.